Hello, this is Elizabeth Hinkson with Acute Care Education. I'm going to be presenting the alcohol withdrawal case study for Medical Surgical Clinical Academy and Progressive Care Clinical Academy. Welcome to our new online format. You may see me glancing down because that's where my notes are. So um, just, you know, hang in there. That's going to be all right. So um, we're going to start with the first slide, and as you'll see, it says, that's the problem with drinking, I thought, as I poured myself a drink. If something bad happens, you drink in an attempt to forget, and if something good happens, you drink in order to celebrate, and then if nothing happens, you drink to make something happen, right? So coffee's on the bench, and alcohol's going to suit up. That's what we're going to um, talk about. But before we go too much further, I want to differentiate out what we're going to be seeing in acute care. Um, versus what may be happening in the ER and say the ICU. You know how like every autumn um, there's some terrible news story about some some poor college kid who you know went off to college and then drank themselves silly and then didn't wake up the next day. So that is acute alcohol intoxication. That is a problem again for the ER and possibly the intensive care unit. That is not what we are talking about. We are talking about chronic alcoholism where um, your body has adapted to a certain amount of alcohol, and so our problems come in um, in the acute setting when um, uh, alcohol uh, intake has suddenly stopped, but all those um, adaptations that your body has developed, those are ongoing. So we're going to look at first what, uh, what is it that um, alcohol does, and again this is over time. This isn't uh, suddenly somebody decided to um, you know, drink a large quantity of alcohol. This is over time, years, uh, these adaptations develop. So alcohol does two things. Um, first, uh, it enhances GABA. If you remember um, your uh, a nervous system, so you have parasympathetic and sympathetic, right? So GABA is one of the main um, neurochemicals in uh, the whole parasympathetic, the whole relax, the, remember from nursing school, the rest and digest, right? So we're going to enhance, we're going to have more of that ah, relax, right? But that's not the only way that alcohol achieves that. At the same time, we are enhancing uh, our parasympathetic nervous system with uh, you know, supporting that GABA function. At the same time, we're going to be limiting our um, sympathetic nervous uh, system, you know, the whole fight or flight. Uh, the anxiety, you know, the, the fast thinking, all of that, we're going to limit the signal for that, and that would be glutamate. So glutamate is the um, neurotransmitter that does a lot of engaging your fight or flight response, your, your wakefulness, your alertness, your uh, neural processing, all of that. So I'm going to do two things to get that whole effect from alcohol, right? I'm going to encourage the GABA, and I'm going to really limit the glutamate. So um, over time, uh, your body's like, well, this isn't going to work because I need to be awake. Um, you know, I need to function. And so your body adapts to alcohol, kind of like it does to a lot of medications. So um, your body's like, well, if I have all of this kind of relax going on, I'm going to just actually dial back the amount of GABA I make. I'm just going to stop making quite so much. Um, and at the same time, I really, uh, I would like to still... Um, how glutamate av available, right? Because you know, your body wants to be um, awake and interactive uh, with the environment. So because there's not a lot of glutamate, your body starts building extra glutamate receptors. So whatever glutamate comes by, it's going to find an open receptor to attach to. So I turn way down the amount of GABA that I'm making, um, and I've built a bunch of extra receptors for glutamate. This is why when you're going in and you're doing your um, initial assessment on someone and you get to those questions about, you know, do you uh, uh, drink alcohol and then how much? And then um, you end up with kind of a, a large amount. And he's like, oh, well, I drink, you know, a, a whole case of beer a day or something. And so you have usually two questions after that. You're kind of thinking, um, well, who has the time for that first, right? And then the next thing that you tend to think is, you know, well, why are you still awake and talking to me? And the answer to that really is that um, adaptation over time. So I have um, suppressed my natural GABA because I have alcohol for that, and I've built a bunch more glutamate receptors because um, uh, alcohol suppresses how much glutamate is available. To kind of carry on that thought, we're looking at uh, physiologic uh, withdrawal, and then again from the sympathetic end, which means we're really talking about uh, glutamate. Uh, 
couple other things about glutamate. Um, so yes, it's part of your sympathetic nervous system, keeping you awake and alert. It's also important for uh, memory and learning. Um, surely, uh, you know, you've seen one of those movies where there's like, you know, the junk, uh, drunk person um, and they're doing something silly like, uh, like they can't tie their shoe or they're trying to open the door by pulling and it clearly says push, right? You know, all of those things that we associate with um, somebody who is uh, intoxicated or would have a high blood alcohol level. You know, like, well, why is that? And so that goes back to Glutamate, not only does it help you stay awake and alert, it's also important for uh, memory and learning new things. And so, uh, again, the adaptation for that is, well, I don't have a lot of glutamate and I still need to function because my body's you know, job is to survive. So I build a bunch more recept receptors so whatever glutamate comes by, it has a place to land. So then, of course, the problem for that is as soon as we stop um, having uh, that alcohol intake that keeps that balance, so now we have no alcohol, well now I have nothing to inhibit my glutamate. So now suddenly I have a bunch of glutamate available and I also have a bunch of receptors for it to attach. So when we start thinking about the symptoms that we see in somebody who's in alcohol withdrawal, um, a lot of it is that. Well, um, now, you know, when my person is um, hypervigilant, they can't sit still, they can't sleep, their heart rate is up, their respiratory rate is up, their temperature is up, um, they're getting really diaphoretic. All of that is because suddenly I got this big rush of fight or flight response. Um, and now the other half of that, oh, sorry, also have to have the funny slide. If I drink alcohol, I'm an alcoholic. But if I drink Fanta, does that make me fantastic? Um, the, uh, so the other half of that, right, because it's, 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 it's a two-pronged thing. So now I've got this big rush of glutamate. And so I, um, normally in real life, when we get a big rush of, of glutamate, you know, you've all been um, like suddenly scared, right? Like uh, um, you're doing something and suddenly you're like, you kind of see something and you're like, oh no, there's a giant spider or something. You know, you're all familiar with that giant rush of glutamate. But then, you know, you're also familiar with the uh, effect of GABA, which is the, oh, wait, 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 it is not the giant hairy spider. It is, in fact, just the dust bunny that, you know, I haven't swept up for a very long time, right? See so that whole, <sighs> except uh, when we look at alcohol withdrawal, where we were, our body uh, had adapted so that we didn't really make, we turned down our, our GABA a whole bunch. So that now when I have this big rush of glutamate, I have nothing to control it with. So um, when we think about that, a couple of other things about that. Um, you know how when your person uh, is uh, hallucinating, uh, you already expect that the hallucination uh, that your person is going to have is going to be, um, you know, something awful. You know, they like, they look up at the ceiling tiles and they're really sure they're bugs or they think something uh, usually unpleasant, like there's never, you know, oh, yay, the cute bunnies, or look at all of the balloons. And so again, you know, like, well, why is that? Well, it turns out that, that GABA is actually important in controlling fear and anxiety. It's not just that um, it, it supports all of your parasympathetic uh, processes. It also is, um, you know, looking at turning, turning down that fear and managing it. But now you don't have any, so the big rush of the sympathetic uh, nervous system and then nothing to counteract. So when we look at, at our symptoms in alcohol withdrawal, what we're really trying to do is safely manage someone until the body starts to re-regulate in you know, three to seven days, right? So we are going to be giving them so, something like Ativan to kind of support that, what GABA would have been doing for them um, anyway, until it starts doing it uh, on its own. Um, and again, turning down the GABA and um, having the extra receptors was how your body was going to get along um, uh, with a bunch of alcohol on board. And so, funny slide, sorry. There, there were several of those when I was making this presentation. <laughs> uh, not to get technical, but according to chemistry, alcohol is a solution. All right, so we're going to take those ideas that we just talked about and we're going to walk them through a little case study. And so we're going to meet Walter. Walter D. Bartolomeo is a pleasant 72-year-old man. He is a retired middle school teacher and lives in Everett with his girlfriend. But alas, about midnight, uh, last night Walter fell down the stairs. You can see the offending stairs there. He fell down, he thunked his melon, and he ended up in the ER. 
Uh, overall, he seems fine. Um, stitches, uh, staples, he should be fine. However, um, the ER staff is considering, you know, why did Walter fall down? Uh, and they also happen to notice that he is a little disoriented. So they decide to do some investigating. And some of the things they discover is that his blood alcohol level is uh, 0 0.29. And then just as a frame of reference, um, blood alcohol concentration is 0.1% or 0.1 gram of alcohol for every deciliter of, of blood. Sometimes they uh, move the point and they'll, instead of telling you 0.29, they'll just say uh, 29. And depending on which lab, I can't remember if our lab does that, sometimes they move the decimal two places and they'll tell you 290 instead. But um, look at the um, reference uh, on your lab report to help you gauge where that is. And then to also kind of put that into a little bit of context, where would you be if your blood alcohol level was 0 0.29, right? So the scale that you're seeing is really about um, somebody who is not a chronic alcoholic. What, what would you be doing? And so if you came in with an alcohol level of 0 0.29, you can see on your slide there, uh, that would fall into the severe impairment category um, all the way down to signs of alcohol um, uh, poisoning, loss of consciousness, um, all of your uh, memory coordination attention are going to be dangerously impaired. And you'll notice that that is not what uh, Walter is doing with his blood alcohol level of 0 0.29. So um, again, we kind of already know that we're going to end up in some uh, withdrawal. One other thing to just mention before we carry on is, you know, if we think about, well, what is the legal limit for alcohol in Washington State? It is 0 0.08. And so you may have, and, and this is really that, that, you know, what is the legal limit is pretty much only related to driving. Like at what point, um, legally speaking, would we start to find you more at fault because of your blood alcohol level? So I tracked a bunch of data over many, many years. And so you'll notice on the curve that the uptick of the curve starts at 0 0.08. Um, up to that point, um, somebody who uh, has zero blood alcohol level all the way up to 0 0.08 has about the same likelihood of having an accident. After 0 0.08, that's where that strong uptick starts to occur. And so that is why that is the legal limit, because up to that point, there's really no difference. But luckily, uh, Walter was not driving. So next thing that you look at is Walter's assessment data as he comes in, right? So he's a little restless and anxious, but he's alert and oriented. Um, nothing else is very remarkable, right? He's got his IVs, his skin's thin, pale, dry, some old bruises. A um, little bit of uh, wheeze and ronchi, um, consistent with a little bit of COPD, which we'll find out does uh, show up in his history. But then we slide over and we look at his vital signs, and we notice that his temperature comes in at, at 38. Now, um, in these days of, of COVID-19, uh, we might immediately start considering if he needs to be made a, a COVID rule out. Um, for our purposes, because we're only in here, uh, really meant to be talking about um, alcohol intoxication, we're going to assume that he has he has ruled out for that, right? So let's not put that into play. But his temperature still is elevated. You'll notice his heart rate is elevated. And we know we're used to talking about a respiratory rate of 20 as normal. And physiologically speaking, that's true. It's not hard for your body to have a respiratory rate of 20. But then, you know, is it actually what you would expect somebody sitting on a, a stretcher in the ER to have? Like, is that your, really your res resting respiratory rate? No, your resting respiratory rate is really more about 12, right? So technically normal, but should still make you wonder, you know, why? Um, we see that his oxygen saturation is 95 and he is on room air, so that's all encouraging. And we see it comes into us with a blood pressure of 144 over 88. So when we look at those vital signs, you know, what, what concerns us, uh, if anything, um, and then do these vital signs point to alcohol withdrawal? And so the answer to that question is not yet. You'll notice that when you admit someone or when you're starting to be concerned about alcohol withdrawal, one of the first questions that comes up is, when was your last drink? Because we really don't start saying that whatever you're doing is related to withdrawal until at least six hours have passed, right? That's when we can start saying, 
oh, well, you know, with all of that extra um, glutamate rolling around, of course your temperature is up or your respiratory rate and all of that, right? But we haven't had that window. So whatever we see that would be concerning, you cannot relate to alcohol withdrawal. Because one of the things we want to consider is really what, like, what, what is the risk with alcohol withdrawal or, or mortality? So officially, the mortality related to alcohol withdrawal is something like 5% according to up-to-date, right? But when they tell you that, they're also telling you that that is untreated. So if we bring somebody in like Walter and we intend to, um, to treat him to manage this safely, um, then you would assume that that mortality is actually mu much less than 5%. And you kind of already know that. You don't expect when somebody tells you that you're getting an alcohol withdrawal patient, you aren't like, you know, oh no, where's the crash cart? Because this could turn bad, right? That's not normally what we think. Um, but when we do look at mortality and alcohol withdrawal, it's usually because we miss something. We start taking everything we see and we're like, because he's with, he's in withdrawal, right? Um, and we need to be very, very careful that we aren't missing something. Lots of things are kind of subtle, and we could miss them. Like, why oh, does he have a temperature of 38 at this time? Um, did he aspirate when he fell down those stairs? Is he cooking up a pneumonia? I don't know. Could be. Uh, why is his heart rate up? I don't know. You know, is he dehydrated for some reason? Or again, is that um, a marker of infection? If you look at these vital signs, um, you see his MUSE is three. Um, remember, MUSE is, is what one of the gauges of whether um, someone is displaying signs of, of sepsis, right? So um, it's uh, interesting. Like, wh like what else uh, would we like to know to make us make sure that we understand the cause of um, any vital sign changes? Um, and so when I made this uh, PowerPoint, uh, one of the things that uh, was an objective was to differentiate between the types of alcohol. Now, um, when I was growing up, there you know wasn't really a lot of TV and all of that, so we had the choose your own adventure books, right? And so you'd be reading the page and you get down to the bottom of the page and they'll be like, do you want to walk into the creepy abandoned building? Or do you want to turn left into the dark and shadowy forest, right? And then you got to turn the page and find out, you know, if you made the right choice or if you died, right? So we're going to play Choose Your Own Adventure with alcohol because it turns out there's three kinds of alcohol, right? There is um, the um, ethyl alcohol, which is the only one that is the beverage, right? Where does that E-T-O-H abbreviation come from? come from and and that is where right so like uh, ethanol the only kind that we can drink but then we also have isopropyl alcohol which we're probably a little bit more familiar with now than normal uh, so think about your alcohol pads um, think about your hand sanitizers uh, and um, that obviously is not a beverage right we can't go around licking our alcohol pads so um, the isopropyl alcohol if somebody did drink it um, I think it's somewhere between uh, half an ounce to two ounces uh, to be fatal for isopropyl alcohol, so totally shouldn't drink that. And then the third type of alcohol is the one I refer to as wood alcohol or methyl alcohol, and that one's actually a certified poison. You don't even have to drink it. It seeps uh, through your skin. Do you remember, um, I don't know, probably a month or two ago, uh, there was an airline that was making an emergency landing, I think in California, and they're flying over a school, and they had to dump all their fuel to land safely. I don't know if you remember that. And everybody was like, oh my gosh, we dumped a bunch of stools, uh, um, airplane fuel on um, a bunch of kids, and then what was the concern besides that would, you know, obviously be kind of gross and nasty? Well, methyl alcohol is, is part of that fuel, um, but apparently it all evaporates out really quickly, so there was actually, um, it was okay. So uh, that's a long explanation for um, why this slide exists, like choose your own adventure. Which one did Walter drink? Well, hopefully he drank ethanol or else it's going to be a lot shorter case study, right? Ethanol is the only one that is a beverage. Speaking of Walter, we're going through how he ended up with us tonight, right? Uh, so it turns out that he was following his usual routine for the past three years, which involves spending most evenings helping his neighbor, who is a local beer brewer. See, he's helping. Um, his girlfriend reports that this is his third fall in the past 13 months, and previous falls results in some scrapes and bruising, but did not require hospitalization, right? You're going through a surgical medical history, he's going straight down your um, admit assessment. Um, you see that he has no interest in addressing his alcohol uh, intake, and he does not believe that that is contributing to his recent bout of falls. All his vaccinations are up to date. His surgical history is uninteresting. He does have a little bit of COPD. 
um, stage one. Some hypertension, osteoporosis, peripheral vascular disease. It does say that he has a 37 year smoking history, but he quit. And it does say that he uh, did a whole lot of pots in the 70s and 80s, but you know, he taught middle school, so we'll give him a break, right? Uh, so Helen is his girlfriend. Wait, wait, there, wait. There's Helen. Helen's gonna show up. Um, and in the beginning, we get the feeling like, oh, Helen is somebody we can work with because she's telling us things like, well, he's often falling down drunk and he keeps a keg in the basement to avoid the shakes if he can't get to the store. And so you're like, okay, this is, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna see if we can um, help uh, Walter see the error of his ways. But then she starts telling you things like, you know, he's worked hard his whole life and he deserves to enjoy himself now. And so that's gonna maybe change a little bit about how we um, are gonna approach their relationship. Because remember that sometimes with um, chronic alcoholism, we run into some codependency. Um, and so we um, might, might be looking at that. And she also tells you that, um, that Walters explained to her all the benefits of drinking. And she says, people just don't talk about it enough. Drinking can prevent strokes, you know, right? Oh, look, there's, there's Helen again, right? So uh, let, let's consider, because um, one of the limits of um, hearing little bits of science show up in the news is um, we take them and use them at our convenience. Um, every couple of years, there is some new cure-all, right? Um, do you remember when uh, antioxidants were like the magic, right? And everybody's going to the store trying to buy the freshest possible vegetables or fruits, and which one was magic, right? Do you remember when blueberries were like gonna fix everything and we should just start washing in them? Well, and then we had that thing for a while where um, um, chocolate, chocolate was the best, right? But, you know, when you look a little bit further, that's not exactly what they said. And they also were only referencing the chocolate that nobody actually wants to eat, right? Um, and then we move on to the, the, the one that was about um, alcohol. Well, once again, they were, they were only talking about um, red wine, and they were talking about the moderate uh, intake as potentially being a benefit. And as you're probably aware, uh, after being in school, science is a really long conversation. So just because one study comes out and says a certain thing is possible or likely, um, there's going to be follow-up studies to that that is going to further show you if that was actually um, something of value or it turns out that that is not actually so, right? That's how that conversation goes. But the trouble with getting your um, little bits of information from whatever is catchy to be put into the news is, um, you know, you never get back to the part about how, oh, right, that turned out to not be so. They would never circle back to that kind of thing. So we can understand how somebody like Helen might come up with um, some of these very convenient ideas, right? We kind of all do it. I mean, I was super excited about the chocolate thing for a little while, I admit. Um, and then when we look at, well, what are the things that alcohol could potentially have done? Uh, well, it is true that um, it does uh, uh, tend to decrease um, clotting a little bit, right? It's a little bit of an a anti-inflammatory, anti-clot. But then any benefit that you potentially had, and the benefit is small, right? I mean, you don't go to your provider. Your provider's not like, oh, yes, we need to prevent blood clots. You know, go drink your red wine. That's not how that works. So um, any benefit is in the, the small to moderate, and we'll remember that's about four ounces a day. Uh, and then you move over to the, well, if your intake is large, all the benefit is lost, and you're into all of the, the, the problems. Um, remember Warnke Korsakoff syndrome? We'll talk about that again here in just a second. All of those, um, delusions, hallucinations, pancreatitis, hepatitis, all of those, and as much, much more likely uh, where Walter's going to end up, right? So, um, going to need to have some uh, some conversations with both of them, but you know, probably not right now we're trying to um, admit them, but it's going to come up. So one of the things we just kind of talked about a little bit was um, pancreatitis, and we also want to look at uh, fluid and electrolytes and the effect of alcohol on those. So um, remember how we said that we're going to decrease the amount of GABA. Um, uh, one of the things that GABA does for you in relation to digestion is it triggers the release of your pancreatic enzymes. Except you don't really have a lot of GABA and alcohol does not do that function. So your pancreatic enzymes don't get a lot of signal to get released. So like most pancreatitis, um, 
you still make those uh, pancreatic enzymes, um, but they have nowhere to go, so they just kind of pack into your pancreas until um, they, uh, all that kind of squeezing together, they start to um, become active and they start to auto-digest the pancreas. That is the alcohol-related pancreatitis that people run into. It can be that kind of chronic underlying thing. Um, if you stop drinking, that problem will go away. So you got that. So if you don't have a lot of pancre pancreatic enzymes, your ability to absorb your nutrients is poor. Um, probably familiar with the idea of how it damages the lining of the stomach. And so whatever absorption we were getting from there, you know, like our iron and things like that is going to be impaired, and particularly our B vitamins. So even if you have somebody who still um, maintains an adequate diet, um, they will still look or have significant nutritional deficiencies because we've impacted um, how this gets absorbed. Um, so while we are admitting uh, Walter, you know, going through our giant list of things, turn on our red dot screen, right? The provider was then talking to Helen. And you know how sometimes when your provider is talking to your family and your family is like, oh yes, totally, we totally understand, we totally agree. And then your provider leaves, you know how your, your patient or family sometimes they, they turn to you because now um, they want you to explain whatever it was that the provider was telling them, right? So. Helen wants to know if Walter has the DTs or delirium treatments. Uh, she wants to know if Walter is going to die. Uh, and kind of a similar question, she wants to know how serious is his withdrawal. So um, to answer those, we again want to go back to um, what is it that we kind of know about how withdrawal works. So her first question was about, is Walter in delirium treatments? So if you look at this chart, which again comes straight from up to date, um, when would you start, first start to be able to say delirium treatments? You'll notice that doesn't start until 48 hours from last drink would be kind of the early time that you would see that. You'll also notice the key thing about um, delirium treatments is uh, you are now confused, like that, that disorientation where um, now you think you're in jail or you're at your house, those kind of things. We can't reorient somebody back to the fact that they're in the hospital um, you know, and what day and year it is. So that confusion, that is the, the, the kind of the hallmark sign that, oh yeah, delirium treatments. Now you notice that hallucinations can start much sooner. Now the difference between just hallucinations and delirium treatments is that with hallucinations you can bring somebody back to where, where they actually are, to reorient, right? So um, often people will, will be like, you know, again, with the bugs, because the way that ceiling tiles are made, people always think they see, you know, bugs out there, like, are there bugs on the ceiling? And you're going to be like, no, that's the way the tile is made, and they will be able to believe you. They're going to be like, yeah, I didn't think so. Um, that is the difference. So we see that, you know, minor withdrawal can start happening at about the six-hour mark, and those are those, um, you know, kind of low-level, though, um, you know, they'll definitely make you feel bad. You know, that's the anxiety, the headache, the sweating, the, um, all the GI upsets, um, and uh, insomnia. And then you, as you move across, as time passes, well, then your uh, symptoms intensify. We add in the hallucinations. Um, you can see a couple of seizures. Um, now, alcohol withdrawal seizures are a little bit different than the seizures that you normally are thinking about, right? Because usually if our person has a seizure that we weren't expecting, you know, we're like, well, that cannot be good. That is a bad sign. Uh, alcohol withdrawal seizures are relatively benign, usually, um, and conveniently, we're going to manage them the same way, right? What are we going to give you for alcohol withdrawal? Out of van, you know, what do you do when someone's having a seizure? Out of van, so, you know, kind of convenient, right? So, uh, seizures are the clue that um, delirium treatments is more likely than not um, in your patient. Um, but otherwise, it doesn't point to a poor outcome. Um, so um, definitely note them, manage them, all of that, but uh, don't, don't assume that that adds to a poor outcome. One thing I would also mention um, off of this slide is back to that 5% mortality that we were talking about. Um, and you notice that, um, you know, well, well, what are the risks associated to that? Well, it's uh, older age. Remember that Walter is 72. It is having, uh, you know, other health issues. Remember, he has some hypertension, peripheral disease, and a little bit of COPD. So he would actually fall into a little bit of a higher risk category than maybe some of your other people. But again, we, we expect this to all turn out um, fine. I don't have any reason not to. 
Oh, and this is my favorite funny slide. It's also my last one if you find them annoying. It says, Dear Alcohol, we had a deal where you would make me funnier, smarter, and a better dancer. But I saw the video and we need to talk. Again, look at mortality of 5%. Um, I think we uh, covered that uh, pretty well. So we're admitting Walter and the provider is outside and he's gonna put in your order. So the next couple of screenshots that I'm going to show you are what your provider is doing. Remember, we really do our best not to take verbal orders. And when a provider is ordering a protocol, there's questions embedded in it. So you wouldn't be able to do that even if they had asked you to, right? So this is what a provider will be doing. So they go through and you'll notice the first thing that they order is the CWA protocol. So what is the CWA protocol? What do they actually ask you to do? So um, the CWA assessment is done at a minimum every four hours. So notice that does include um, nighttime. So if you're on the protocol, you're waking somebody up every four hours. If you're finding that that is causing more trouble than it's solving, or you don't need to medicate someone, those kind of things, talk to your provider make a different plan um just you know under a protocol you can't change the plan if you hadn't haven't talked to the person who initiated it uh this also tells you like when when would you call the provider um and so it says you know risk to self or others which is kind of the same thing as the next statement which is severe agitation confusion excuse me or hallucinations if you had to go and reassess them because they are getting you know, more pronounced system symptoms instead of less. Um, if you've given them medication twice and you're still not seeing an improvement, and notice they ask you to wait to make sure that um, that second dose of medication had an opportunity to work before you, um, you call them. A couple of other things. If they are agitated, anxious, or tremulous, um, but your CWA score isn't high enough to give them medication to call the provider. So um, some of that is, again, what if um, it's not just alcohol withdrawal, what if it is alcohol withdrawal on top of something else to make sure that we are not missing something. So your CWA protocol helps you with every time you're going to need to call a provider, right? So make sure that we look at what it actually says. The no other, next thing that your provider is going to do is around prophylaxis. So your provider is going to ask Walter a couple of questions to determine if we should, if we expect him to go into withdrawal, right? And we, we kind of do, right? So should we just sit around and watch the show, or should we give him some medication to blunt that a little bit so um, we will have an easier time maintaining his safety? Uh, and so to do that, your provider will fill out the prediction of alcohol withdrawal severity scale, also cutely called PAWS, um, to decide if we should dose your um, patient. And it's like Librium is usually what we would use for someone uh, of Walter's age, but you can also see that there are other options like the Ativan that they, they could use as well. And this is an example of the scale. And again, this is your provider's question list. This is what they will ask to determine if we're gonna pre-medicate. But you can see that Walter will score high enough to qualify. Uh, intoxicated in the last 30 days, history of um, withdrawal, um, history of DTs, and some of this we kind of know from listening to Helen talk that he's gonna score on these points. Uh, blood alcohol level greater than 200. Remember he was, um, what we were saying was 0.29, but for this they've moved the decimal two places, so he was 290. So um, yeah, he would probably qualify. So there's the prophylaxis, which means we're trying to blunt symptoms. And then there's what we're used to seeing, which is the symptom management. I'm going to do a CWA scale. I am going to take that number to my MAR and determine how much medication I'm going to give. Your provider would have given you either oral medication or IV medication. Um, remember that oral is almost always safer. So given a choice, that would be the preferred. But then we also know, well, a lot of our patients are going to be nauseated. We just got done saying how um, absorption uh, via the oral route is not uh, always a sure thing in alcohol withdrawal. So a lot of times we end up on the IV. So if the oral isn't working, again, just call up your provider and have a conversation so that you can get the um, right medication. So if we look at this, we see that um, we can have Ativan or we can have Valium. And again, also could have the oral. 
Uh, and so our provider will order one of those and we'll do it. So if our CWA was uh, 14, uh, you see if your CWA is 14 and you gave the IV, you give two milligrams and reassess in two hours. You also see if you were on the oral and you had a CO of 14, you gave two milligrams and you reassess in two hours. So the scales are really very similar. Similar. The only variation is when your CO is higher, um, like above 20, and then because the IV has a shorter time before it's bioavailable, uh, you would be able to reassess and retreat uh, at 30 minutes instead of having to wait an hour like you would with the oral. Other things to consider, because um, it's, not, it's not just um, about Ativan and CWA scale when you're trying to manage someone in alcohol withdrawal. Uh, back to poorly absorbed nutrients, particularly the B vitamins. So we think about folate and thymine. Um, and so we will always or often make sure that we are giving them some folate and thymine um, initially. Uh, that is to manage uh, Wernicke's and Korsakoff's and a chronic um, alcoholic. Uh, and we, we do want to talk about that um, a little bit more. Um, so uh, if you remember from nursing school, Wernicke's is actually not, uh, in our country, Wernicke's is pretty much always associated with alcohol withdrawal. In other countries where um, uh, food is not always as assured as it is here, they can have Wernicke's just because they do not have access to um, to a sources of B vitamins. But for us, Wernicke is pretty much always secondary to uh, um, alcoholism, and then that is because you cannot absorb your B vitamins. So um, do you remember when we were talking about um, diabetes, you know, like you need the insulin for the glucose to get in the cell? Well, in the brain, you don't actually need insulin for glucose to get in the cell. Instead, you actually need um, thymine, thymine for glucose to get into the cell. But if you're a chronic alcoholic, you don't run enough thymine to always make that process, su process successful. So then you end up, over time, having neuron death. And that is what Wernicke's really is, is that it is a um, decrease in, in brain function. Um, now when you look at classic symptoms and uh, even kind of the more general symptoms like the fatigue, irritability, and, and, and apathy, you will have a hard time differentiating Wernicke's from just regular alcohol withdrawal because uh, the symptoms are pretty much the same, which is why again we often just go ahead with the thymine and the folates up front so we can be managing Wernicke's. Wernicke's um, is relatively fixable uh, if we are able to replace those uh, that thymine and folate. Now you may um, also remember uh, Korsakoff's because he was always Wernicke's Korsakoff's, right? So Wernicke's would be the milder form and then if it is not fixed you end up in Korsakoff's which is the same process but you've lost more neurons that you are not um, going to get back. Uh, and this is, uh, when you end up in Korsakoff's, your person is probably not going to be able to live independently anymore because they don't have the problem solving to, to get by. So adult family homes, that, that kind of thing is where they're going to end up. Now, while weren't keys, you could be like, oh yeah, over time, you know, like six months or whatever, probably could fix that. But Korsakoff's is not like that. Um, you're looking at at least two years and only 25% of those people would have significant improvements. 50% will have something, and 25% um, we, we, there won't be um, any improvement. Um, and when we say some improvement, again, living by yourself uh, as an independent person may not really be a, um, a likely uh, outcome. So again, with the thymine and folate, we want to make sure that we have those on board, on board because they're going to be uh, running low. Other things that we make sure that our provider considers when they're doing their orders are anti-nausea med medications like Zofran, uh, and something probably for headaches, that kind of thing. And we talked about CWA, right? We watched our CWA videos and we did our CWA scale. And so our initial CWA scale on Walter is going to come out as 21. Now, if we remember back to what our CWA protocol was telling us, what do we do with the CWA at 21? It says that at 20 or greater, we call up our provider. Um, and that conversation is really about, you know, it's a pretty high CWA score. So is this person, should they stay in, in uh, acute care? Do they need to go to the ICU? Did we put them on the right uh, medication pathway? Are we able to keep them safe is, is the conversation. So at a CWAP 20 or greater, we will call up our provider. And suppose we do, and our provider's like, well, you know, we are going to give them that Librium 
uh, as the prophylaxis, and we're going to go ahead and give them a pretty decent amount of Ativan based off of our MAR. Um, and we give them our folate, acid, and, and thiamine. And so let's give them a couple of hours. Usually they will watch them for two to four hours before they make any decision. You know, oh, is this going to stable out or is it going to get worse and would you need to transfer them? So we go ahead and for CO21, we gave four milligrams of IV Ativan. We came back in 30 minutes to reassess, so we did another CWA. Remember, we did that CWA exactly the same, like it showed us in the video. We asked the questions the same, so they're comparable. Our second CWA is 17. So we would again, according to that, give another four milligrams of IV Ativan, but now we wait an hour to reassess. And then our third CWA comes in, and now we are down to 11 uh, at that point. For CWA of 11, our MAR says we're going to give two mg of Ativan, and now we're going to reassess in two hours. Remember, on your CWA protocol, if your person is worse, um, you know, they started yelling or throwing things or whatever their risk was, you had to reassess them early, that's fine, but it's also a call to your provider. The other thing to consider about what is Ativan actually going to do for you? Um, so for your patient, what it does is um, helps them to withdraw safely. That doesn't mean that they are an easy uh, or cooperative patient. Um, it means that they are withdrawing safely. So during these time frames where we're like, oh, your CO was 21, and in 30 minutes you're going to give them, come back and reassess and give them some more out of it. You know, where, where do you think you are in that 30 minutes? Were you like, bye-bye, I'll see you in half an hour? Probably not. Somebody with a CWA 21 probably isn't somebody that can be kind of left to their own devices. So what are your nursing skills, right? Because yes, medication, but um, nursing is never just feed somebody some medication and see how that works, right? What else is in your bag of tricks to keep your person safe? That's why they're in the hospital, right? So um, as we drop their CWA to something much, much more reasonable, yes, the amount of time you spend with them will be less, but not in the beginning. Ativan was never meant to save you from, from that, right? Withdrawal is a challenge to manage, um, but that's why they're in the hospital with you. So we will always also make sure we consider um, what is our magic um, to manage them. Now, let's flip back to what the vital signs would look like during those time frames. So we had the CO21 initially, and so we now are looking at three sets of vital, vital signs for the 21, the 17, and the CO of 11, right? So as we go across, we would expect to see um, as our CWA drops, that our vital signs should shift a little bit back to normal if the problem in the vital signs is related to alcohol. So if you get all the way over to a CWA of 11, and that's the one that says the 1545 time slot, you'll notice a couple of things that maybe you have thought would have improved that did not, right? You see his temp or excuse me, his heart rate is down to 104. So it seems like that is going along. So that makes that's encouraging. We see that his blood pressure is ticking down. But then we look at his temperature and then also his respiratory rate. We see, in fact, his respiratory rate has climbed. I got a respiratory rate of 24 now, which is odd because when I had a CWA of 21, I didn't have a respiratory rate of 24. And then my temperature is essentially unchanged. So if I am managing my alcohol withdrawal, so uh, then, or if these were alcohol withdrawal, then those should have been, you know, more relaxed. So what, what would you normally think if I told you somebody had a temperature of 38.3 and a respiratory rate of 24? And you'd be like, well, you know, back to COPD or, or you know, pneumonia, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. So those things are still very possible for, for Walter. Um, we need to be careful to remember that comorbidities are, are underneath alcohol withdrawal. So what did we do? Well, we gave him, again, the folate and the thymine. Um, we were covering him with the Ativan. We gave him his prophylaxis with his Librium. Gave him a bunch of fluids to rehydrate. Uh, tried to talk about nutritional supplementation, which we should, and dietary will help you out with that. Just remember, um, it's gonna take you many days to see benefit from that, long after he has left you. Uh, and his absorption remains impaired for a while, so we may not see a lot of benefit from that, but we should try. 
Um, and we follow our pathway, our protocol for CIWA assessment and, and medication. So we do that for a couple of days, and now it is time for Walter to be discharged. And we've scheduled his follow-up appointments. We have done our best about uh, educating Walter for alcohol consumption. He's not super receptive. Um, he's still experiencing minor withdrawal symptoms, that nausea, that light sensitivity, the headache, the fatigue, and those can hang around up to six months. So even though you have stopped drinking, you may still um, you know, not feel well. I mean, think the last time you had like a headache, nausea, and fatigue, you weren't a happy guy, right? So those can hang around for a while. And he also tells you that he is not planning to stop drinking, but he does agree to drink less which means chances are good Walter will come back to us before too long. Uh, and then this last picture you'll see is a sliding glass door because Walter has agreed that in the future he's going to go in the back door where there are no stairs. So, you know, at least there's that. All right, so uh, that concludes our case study on um, alcohol withdrawal. Uh, and I believe we're going to be presenting this to you through Yammer. So um, as questions arise, go ahead and post those and uh, we will get back to you. And thanks very much for watching.